How's it, how's it, how's it, cuz? It's time to Valaau with me, Mr. Valaau Dickie Chang. Join us as we meet your uncles, your aunties, your brothers, your sisters. Your brothers, sisters, uncles, cousins, neighbors, grandmother, all the ohana. We'll take you to breathtaking places you've never been. Meet famous people you've never seen. Kick back and cruise, you know the ruse. Hawaii, mahalo nui lo, and thank you for joining us this week in yet another exciting and informative episode of Valaau. I'm Dickie Chang. What happened to the entire year? This month of September is almost done, and guess what? It's that time of the year for the annual migration of the native birds here on our island of Kauai, better known to all of us as the Newell Shearwater. What is the Newell Shearwater, you ask? Well, let's recap last season's Newell Shearwater count. That uh, season would be officially September 15th to December 15th. No better person to tell us a little bit about the Newell Shearwater is our very dear friend, the longtime coordinator of the program, SOS Save Our Shearwaters, Tracy Anderson. Uh, the, the season went fairly uneventfully. It was, uh, we had a really good team and we got, uh, of, the, uh, of the birds that we got live, of the Newell Shearwaters we got live, uh, there was a 91% 90 release rate. So that was really good. We got most of them out the door in good condition. Um, about just about less than half uh, we did what was called direct release we did look them over in the field uh, the technicians know how to uh, examine them make sure there's no injuries uh, their feathers are uncontaminated uh, they take a few measurements put a band on and then they release them um, just over half of them came, had to come back to the Humane Society in our little area here for a further further examination, make sure there's no injuries, no contamination, uh, that sort of thing. Um, most of them only spend a few days in care. Uh, we had 20, just over 20 birds that spent more than seven days in care here uh, before they were released again. Uh, yeah, that's... When you say it's an event, uh, uneventful season, we want to let the viewing audience know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the season technically is from September 15th to December 15th. Yes, that's correct. So the fledging seasons, when the the young uh, uh, Newell shearwaters, when they're ready to fledge from their mountain burrows, and um, they do it at night, and they do it with no parental care. So basically, the parents have been coming back and forth from the ocean at night throughout the whole breeding season, feeding these chicks. And when the chicks are ready to go, they're all uh, their their feathers are all in. They're at a good weight they um, fledge and they do it by themselves. Like the parents aren't there around at all um, and they take off at night and they head out to sea. And that takes it starts taking place in September and it goes through into October. Um, and then by the end of October, Newells are, fair, are starting to um, you know, finish their fledging. And then we have Hawaiian petrels that also fledge, which is another endangered species here. They start fledging here on Kauai. Um, and also we have the wedge-tailed shearwaters that nest here on Kauai, which nest on the periphery of the island. They start fledging at the, in, into November and then into December. Now, when you say the parents go out at night mm -hmm. uh, and everything is basically done at night, when you say the parents go out to, to get food or what have you, mm -hmm. does mommy stick back and daddy goes out or does daddy stick back and mommy goes out or are both of them out at the same time? Yeah, both of them are out at the same time. The chick, after the first week, after the, after the, the um, incubate during the incubation period there's always a, a parent with it so both the male and the female both the dad and the mom um, share parental incubation duties uh, so one goes out to sea the other one um, incubates the egg once the egg has hatched um, the one parent it's called a guard phase um, will stick around for about a week and stay with the chick to make sure that it's thermoregulating keeping its temperature um, and all that and then after that, both parents are out at sea foraging for the chick. So the chick is left alone in it by itself in its burrow. So if one or the other unsuccessfully comes back, heaven forbid, mm -hmm. then it's the task of the other one to double duty in terms of, I would guess, supplying food uh, or making a decision whether they, do they, would they tend to bail the chick and 
take care of themselves? Well, unfortunately, they will continue to come back and forth. Uh, if one of the parents is lost, the other parent will continue to feed the chick. The problem is, is that it really is a two parent, parent duty to get f enough food to feed that chick for a successful fledge. So if if one of the parents is lost late in the season, it's possible that the bird, uh, the chick can leave at a good good condition. But if a parent is lost, usually the chick ends up in relatively poor condition and the likelihood of survival is very small. And the parents, or in this case, the mother would only lay one egg? Yes, they only lay one egg per season. So there's one egg per pair per season. And if that egg is lost at any point, um, or the chick lost, they do not re-nest in that season. They, it has to wait, they have to wait till the next year to lay another egg. So are these birds, like some other birds, are they lifers? Like the, they they meet, they mate, they pair for life, how's that go? They tend to stay together, yes. They, if when they get that mate that um, they are, uh, they've raised chicks successfully with, they tend to stay with the same mate um, throughout their lives. If one of the, the parents is lost, one of the adults is lost, it may take a season or two for the remaining adult to find another mate um, to continue breeding. Um, yeah, that's... It's, it's a long process. It's why their population can't grow very quickly. Um, and it's a really, it's a, it's a big deal if an adult is lost. Now, you know, I've always wondered, and I'm sure a lot of the viewing audience uh, are probably thinking, now when you say that the, the parents will split the baby at night that's fully fledged with the proper weight or the physical abilities will then jump off a cliff or a higher elevated area out to sea, <laughs> then what? Where do they find who they need to find? Or is it's it instinctual. For this species, um, so some bird species have a parental care period when after they fledge, um, like the boobies do, um, some of the other species here, they continue to come back and forth to where they, they nested and the parents will continue to feed them while they learn to hunt. Uh, the shearwaters and petrels, they're, it's purely instinct. When they leave the nest, they're on their own. They have to figure out where to find food, how to find food, all that kind of thing. And it's all, it's all up there. And, and, and Tracy Anderson, remind me of this word that I always mispronounce. Palangic or, the palangic or correct me, but those are the birds that live on the water all their life and they, you know, they, they can't fly from the ground. They need that water to paddle and they need to glide yeah so um it the word is pelagic uh which basically means at sea and they are they do they spend the majority of their lives on the open ocean um they only come to land to breed that's the only reason they need to come to land um they you're right they have their body their body morphology has their legs situated farther back on their body so Unlike something like a duck or a goose that can do a direct takeoff from the ground, they need a forward momentum to get air, airborne. Uh, so either jumping off a cliff or a high spot, um, they run across the water to get that lift. Um, or, and, they, and a good oncoming breeze is, as, is helpful as well. And let us know about their, uh, their uh, not paddles or not their fins or not their, well, I guess it's the feet or the web foot. Mm -hmm. They have some sort of a grip along with the beak that they can elevate they, themselves? They do. They actually can curl their feet quite well and they can use them to help climb. They got little nails on the end. It helps them um, when they're digging their burrows. Like they can cling on to, you know, the bark of trees and the and rocks and things like that too. So they have little kind of, um, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're quite good at climbing actually, using their bill and their, their legs to get up. Now, when you, you say also mother nature or instinctively the weirdest thing about everything is is when they are adults themselves speaking of the babies they almost come back to almost the exact same burrow or the location and that um quite humbly meaning this island of Kauai. yes that's correct they they have high site fidelity which means when they leave and they they fledge from a, a nest site nest at location um they are drawn back to that location um when they're adults so they'll come back to that colony area uh, once they um, once they're ready to breed, um, which is why um, um, the there's some translocation work happening here on island, um, and basically the young are taken before they imprint on their site um, when they're their um, their nest site, and they are being put into an area that is predator proof at up at Nohoku, and um, they 
uh, it's in the hopes to um, build another colony. So those birds will imprint on that site as their breeding colony and they come back there when they're ready to breed. So you have a database when you mentioned that some of these birds were not really injured per se, but they were just fallen because of life, light and disorientation. Mm -hmm. So when it's deemed that they're healthy enough to release, as you, you say, you then tag them, you say, and then how often do, I mean, do you have that database like, oh, this guy was here three years ago, seven years ago, this guy yeah, or so gal, I all, should say. Uh, nearly all in the whole um, time period of this program uh, that have been banded. So uh, each bird gets a, an individual uh, band, uh, a metal band, that will be on it for life. Uh, it is inscribed with unique numbers to that bird. Uh, and it, there is a database, there's a federal database that um, takes these numbers and keeps them in a, um, a loca of all the people that do banding, bird banding, um, but we also have our own database. And uh, actually last year we did have a recapture from a previous fledging season. So we had a downed um, subadult that was unfortunately dead when it was found, but it was from the 2016 uh, season. Um, it was banded as a fledgling at that time. So, you know, we, we chatted and I really love and enjoy, we learn so much from you, Tracy Anderson, but when they're out in the open ocean in the Arctic or Pacific Northwest or wherever it's like cold, 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 and we sometimes uh, kind of compare it to a penguin, probably more so because it's black and white, kind of looks like a little mini tuxedo. Yeah. But let us remind us how long did the, how, how, long can these birds hold their breath and how technically deep do they go to go get their food? Well, the New Wilshire water has been um, uh, seen or uh, documented to dive up to 150 feet. I'm not too sure. I can't remember the breath holding that, but it's like a minute or so at least uh, to get down there, uh, grab its prey and up again. So 150 feet, they're they're pretty deep divers for um, in, in the bird world, yeah. And that's one of the reasons uh, that you repeat again and again to the local public, all of whom want to help, uh, many of whom are visitors that mm -hmm. learn from the hotel or learn from commercials that they hear that it's important to turn the bird over, don't give them water, turn the bird over, meaning not flip them, mm -hmm. but to report it to you folks, mm -hmm. bring it to the nearest fire station, because little things that we don't know, like we got suntan, uh, I don't want to say lotion, but sunscreen, yeah. mm -hmm. that can penetrate within the body just a small spot mm -hmm. and that would that would consequently be that area that the water or the uh, hypothermia or what have you would mm -hmm. be kicking in. Yes, we, we really want to check them over and make certain that they're, water, we call them waterproof. Uh, so those outer feathers, they're, they're their main defense against, um, since they have no place to set down, they go on the water or they're flying out on the ocean. Um, if, they're, if their outer feathers are permeable to water, that is a big problem because the water will seep through into the down underneath. And a lot of us know what, down ha what happens to down when it gets wet. It gets wet and soggy and cold. Those birds will um, then succumb to hypothermia. Uh, they'll stop feeding because they don't want to dive to get their food. Um, and uh, so hypothermia and or starvation. And so we really do want to check them over, make certain that their feathers are in good condition. Um, and otherwise, you know, we have ways of testing that here. Um, and we have pools that we put them in, make certain that they have that um, buoyancy, that waterproofness. Um, that and, and in the odd occasion, I mean, we don't have to do it to too many of them, but we may have to wash them. So if they get road, road oils on them, or something like that, um, they're unable to remove that themselves. So we need to give them a wash and we follow um, oil spill protocols for that kind of thing. So we'll give them a good wash, get their water, their feathers um, clean again, and then they can um, put them all back into order and be waterproof. Do, okay, let's just say, I'm just gonna give you a title like an ornithologist or a scientist or what have you, but do you believe in global warming? <laughs> or climate change? One. Yes, I do. I, I um, believe that it is uh, human-caused climate change, yes. Because I, I would just like to let the viewing audience know we've been blessed to uh, talk about this incredible subject about native birds here mm -hmm. uh, that's been here hundreds of thousands of years ago. But when we chatted with you several times, I remember, you know, there's a, a tropical storm or a little mini hurricane that mm -hmm. the winds are blowing different. It's coming from a weird direction. I mean, it's like the perfect storm and other types of migratory birds that never really pass through the Hawaiian Islands get blown off chart and then the next thing you know they're one of the birds that are discovered on Kauai. Is that an accurate way to say how these uh, these uh, 
climate's changing and pushing it, things yeah through? and it can it can change where things migrate or how they migrate um different wind patterns that sort of thing um you know f fallout that the odd bird year to year that happens on Kauai that is not supposed to be here from other places that has been happening for quite a while because you will get these freak storms when they're they're um they're migrating and things but what it appears to be is that the storms are um, increasing intensity um, and uh, in frequency um, and it, it just may happen more and more well I guess you know when we really think about it that's probably things that happened thousands and thousands of years ago and this is maybe how a lot of the native birds just happened to come to the Hawaiian Islands and then consequently because they might have been blown off chart they, this is the only place that they do they were home so when they would come back then obviously they'd beeline it and come well, to the Garden Island of Kauai. Some of the species actually, um, so the, new, the shearwaters and petrels, they, they actually search out um, island uh, archipelagos and things like that, like Hawaii, because of how they nest as well. So what happens is they nest in holes in the ground. It makes them very vulnerable to uh, mammalian predators. Um, and on these far-flung islands, there used to be no um, uh, m mammals, um, mammalian predators. So um, they populated these these islands um, and uh, did very well until we started introducing those species and those predators here. So that's um, you know that's another way that they they moved around. But we are losing some of the the outer islands to uh, sea level rise, um, more frequent storms. So species like other borrow nesting species like bone and petrels, we don't have them here on on. Hawaii, um, but they their burrows are getting flooded f more frequently, so they lose lose their uh, their chicks and their eggs and things like that. So yeah, it's it's a big problem. So for those people, which are probably very few, or for the visitors, how blessed are we that we don't have mongoose on Kauai? Very very blessed. They are a an amazing little animal in their own right, um, in their native habitat. Um, but they are incredible predators and they are, um, will take prey many times their size sometimes. And the fact that we don't have them here is, is very good. Yeah. They're like, sadly, like the modern day weasel or mm -hmm. Tasmanian yeah. devil. They might not necessarily eat something, but they'll just wipe everything out. Well, they're, they do. And because they're quick, they have a high metabolism. They, they have to eat quite frequently as well. So, and they're, they're really good little predators. And so we're really good. It's really good that we don't have them here. Well, Tracy Anderson, and if you just joined us, we are here with Tracy Anderson. What is your official title? I'm the program coordinator for the Save Our Share Waters program. So... There's not a lot of people that know what you know, not, I mean, humbly speaking. Uh, th I mean, there's other people that do a lot more research on the, um, and other programs that do research on the birds up in the mountains, on their, their breeding sites, on the numbers, the population. Um, I, I specialize in, in the birds once they're, they're the, the ha husbandry side of things. Um, so the handling, the getting them out in good condition, uh, that sort of thing, yeah. But, and basically I was meaning like, say for example, if there's none on Oahu, maybe there's a few on the Big Island, smaller colonies. If it was prevalent all over or the mainland or every place else, people would probably want to try to scoop you up for all the information you know to, to care for that. As always, Tracy Anderson, thank you for joining us on Valao. But leave the viewing audience one key fact that most of us don't know that you want to share with the people in regards to the new Oshi waters here on our Garden Island of Kauai. I'm trying to remember what ones I haven't given you before. Um, I think we've talked about the diving before, uh, the fact that they don't ever drink fresh water, they don't ever need to drink fresh water, they have glands in their in their heads there um, that filter their blood and, and the excess salt in their blood is, is excreted that way, so they don't ever have to drink fresh water. Thank you, Tracy. If you do have any questions, please call the Kauai Humane Society. Remember, if you find a fallen bird, you might want to travel around with a little box and a towel in your car. You see a follow, uh, fallen bird, you can call the Kauai Humane Society. Drop the injured bird off. Don't try to assess the damages yourself. Drop the bird off at the Kauai Humane Society. Or, of course, you can stop off at any one of our many fire departments here on our Garden Island Kauai. We're going to have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll be heading to the North Shore site of, why, of course, South Pacific Mitzi Gaynor. Aloha, Randy Riggin here at King Auto Center. You folks in the market for a new vehicle, uh, we got you covered. You're looking for a truck, all new Ram 1500. Um, if you're looking for a fuel economy, 
all new 2019 Honda Insight. Come on down, stop by. Uh, for my friends and family, come ask for Randy at King Auto Center. Be lifetime friends. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Barbara Bennett, owner and publisher of the Islands Monthly Community Magazine for Kauai. Available at newsstands, mailed to you by request, or at the Honolulu and Lahui airports. I invite you to join our local residents and read our stories. All local, all community, all Kauai. Read for Kauai Magazine on our website, forkauaionline.com. With more feature stories, videos, daily calendar, and local news that will excite and interest you. Visit us daily, weekly on the web, and monthly in print. Mahalo and aloha. Hello and welcome back. Let's head on over to the beautiful North Shore, specifically the former St. Regis Resort. You guys all remember October 3rd, the St. Regis Resort reopened October 3rd, calendar year 2009. What better way to celebrate the 50th anniversary of statehood, 56 years later, Mitzi Gaynor returned in all her glory to proclaim South Pacific Week. Here's Mitzi Gaynor, the star of South Pacific. Prior to this evening's event, we had an opportunity to catch up with the lovely, radiantly talented and effervescent Mitzi Gaynor, and this is what she had to say, reminiscing her stay 50 years ago here on the Garden Island of Kauai. It's amazingly, startlingly beautiful, gorgeous. It's, uh, it's Bally High, isn't it? <gasps> Golly, when I think of the first time we came here 50 years, <clears throat> 50 years ago, it was a green meadow and a hole and the plane landed there. And now I think when we got off at the airport, it was like being in Orly and Paris. I mean, 15 or how many, how many gates do they have? It's me. And you have a great deal to do with this, don't you? You're one of the people that has made this island so exceptional. I mean, look at the beauty of this place. Look at the, the ambiance, the truth and the warmth. I feel I'm rejuvenated, really. Now, how I did... just lost 10 years the minute I got off the plane. Mitzi, tell us, um... You know, when you were first contacted to do South Pacific, did you know about Hawaii or did you review the script or how was that decision made that you wanted to come on to Kauai to film South Pacific? Well, Kauai was a, kind of an unknown entity at that particular time because um, I don't think the tour, you know, we're, again, we're talking 50 years ago, Bebe, and uh, uh, you didn't have that many tourists and there were no, I, you know, I stayed at the Coco Palms Hotel, which was a fabulous place because do you remember, do you, you, I don't think you remember the, of course you do, you do, but they were the, like the, the little cottages with the tin roofs and, and the coconuts would fall and bang on the roof and wake you up in the middle of the night. It, uh, uh, it was, um, I had nothing to do with choosing this island, but the powers that be at 20th Century Fox, uh, Daryl Zanuck, and his whole unit, and Josh Logan, and Rogers and Hammerstein, and everyone concerned with it, decided on this place because it was paradise. So as you were filming the movie, and the movie became a hit, obviously, did you know what the impact was going to be, or did you even fathom what the success would have been like? Well, I thought because the play was so successful, you know, and because the book was such a big success, and because so many people could um, relate to the fact that it was the Second World War, and it would stay in, in part of somebody's life forever and ever and ever. Yeah, I, I had a pretty, but I didn't know it would last this long. I mean, it's kind of like Cher, if you know what I mean. It, um, it retires every so often, but it comes back for one more time. And so uh, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's what we're doing. We're bringing it back. And now, of course, you know it's in, 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 um, in Blu-ray. And so it's, uh, and the sales are amazing because the people want to see it. It's, of course, you can never quite replicate the actual beauty of the island of Kauai. You can't because there are so many spirits. It's so spiritual. But the color, I think you can feel it when you see it. So as you were, you know, notified by your people like, hey, uh -huh. would you like to come to Kauai and celebrate the 50th anniversary of statehood and, yes. of course, the filming of South Pacific? Yes. What was going through your mind at that particular time? I was thrilled. I, I was absolutely thrilled, and I haven't been here for 50 years. You know, Jack and I, my, my dear husband, and I, um, had we've made friends. We're going to see some of them tonight, as a matter of fact, at the gala, or gala, whichever you want to say. And uh, they're the Fujis, and they're wonderful, wonderful friends. And and uh, I'm going to see David Penhollow, who is a, a tr island treasure, as you know. And uh, we've always kept in touch. And um, I, was, I thought it would be one of, now is the time to do it. And um, the opening of the hotel, 
and the f I forgot, you know, I'm so busy. It's all about me, you know, darling. I, I forgot that it was also a celebration of the statehood. So, um, yes, I should be here. God wants me to be here, or all the gods want me to be here, and that's why I'm here. So as your career progressed, you know, like, uh, say, for example, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. 40 years ago, mm -hmm. w was it ever in the back of your mind thinking to yourself, oh, my goodness, the 50th anniversary of South Pacific is right around the corner? No. Um, it just, it, it just came. I mean, all of a sudden I thought, 50 years, my God, it can't be 50 years. Look at me. <laughs> you know all about that. You've been around for a couple of weeks too, haven't you? Uh, it's, um, it's very exciting. It's thrilling. And I'm so glad that I'm still part of it. And I'm so glad that you wanted me to come. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, I beg your pardon, but interestingly, you know, the, the residents of the island of Kauai, the state of Hawaii, and, you know, really our visitor base that's here, when they found out that you're going to be on the island, uh, there's a lot of buzz. There's a, you got a lot of fans out there. Isn't it wonderful? It's so thrilling. It really, really is. Um, I treasure it. Um, you know, I come from an area, Beverly Hills, you know, California, um, Los Angeles, the movie business, you know, it's um, insular, you know, it's, um, there's so much take, take, take there, very little giving, and there's so much giving here, and people are so, I mean, I, I was talking to somebody a little while ago on the other side of the room, and a lady came up and she said, I've always wanted to meet you. And I said, well, I'm, I'm talking to somebody right now, can I? So she had some of her girlfriends and we had a sip of tea together. It's, 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 it's um, life changing, this place is life changing. You know, Mitzi Ginner, you talked earlier about the spirits and you talked a little bit about the mana. You know, when you are able to put your feet in the water and rub your toes in the sand and yes. walk around and mm -hmm. look at the waterfalls and mm -hmm. look at what you remember, can you explain to the viewing audience what that feeling may possibly be like? Well, I'm a city girl, so this is, uh, it's nature, isn't it? I have to tell you that when we arrived here 50 years ago, getting off the plane, uh, we were all girdled and stockinged and purses and shoes and hats to match and gloves. And the minute we breathed the air and the trade winds blew across our skin, we said, let me out of these clothes. And we went and bought mumus and we went native. It was wonderful. And it's, you know, I still have some things that I got here before. I really do. They're put away, but they're still treasures. Well, I'm sure you're going to have a great time with the Fuji e Ohana oh, and with yes, David Penahalo and everybody else. We're going to have fun tonight. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful night. I wish everybody watching you could come and could come and be with us. But you're going to be with us anyway, aren't you, tonight? Absolutely. How could we do it without you? Well, I just want to take this opportunity to share our aloha on behalf of the residents of the island of Kauai and certainly the statehood and all your fans. Why don't you take this opportunity to share your aloha out to the people of Kauai and Niihau? Aloha and mahalo. Oh, we're going to a hooky lao. I can't wait for that to happen tonight. See you later. Thank you, darling. Thank you. What a wonderful delight to meet a wonderful, wonderful, very, very lovely lady. At that time, 79 years young. So if you think about it, that was 10 years ago. Hopefully she's a very healthy 89-year-older right now here in our Garden Island, Kauai. We're going to have to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to tell you folks how you can help the food bank here on our Garden Island, Kauai. Healthier is quality care close to home. Healthier is state-of-the-art facilities and the largest and best team of doctors on Kauai. It's specialty care and caring in a special way. Healthier is Kauai's only comprehensive bone and joint center with expertise in joint replacement, hands, feet, ankles, and sports medicine. Wilcox Health, creating a healthier Hawaii. Hi, my name is Sherry Kawachi. I am a sales representative at King Auto Center where we have the best new and used cars on Kauai. Standing right next to this beautiful brand new Honda Pilot, Come see this and more at King Auto Center. Be sure to ask for me, Sherry Kawachi. Thank you. Welcome back, Koi. As we know, the calendar year 2019 pretty much came and went. Before we know it, it's October, November, and December. Great news for the island of Kauai. Uh, several weeks ago, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Kauai Independent Food Bank. Now, whoever you support Kauai Independent Food Bank, or the Hawaii Food Bank Kauai chapter. It's very important for us to all donate for the uh, less fortunate here on our garden island in the Kauai, the kids, the kupuna, what have you. Now the uh, Kauai Independent food, ba food Bank, I should say, recently celebrated their 25th anniversary. Last year we did an interview with Kauai Food Bank Kauai chapter, uh, Wes Pereira, 
and of course our very dear friend, the President, Ron Mizutani. Here's how we can help the Kauai Food Bank, and of course, we can also donate to the Kauai Independent Food Bank. Here's Station Manager Wesley Pereira and our very dear friend, Ron Mizutani. Uh, this is summertime. The most important thing on our minds is keeping our kids uh, fed at home. So that's why uh, the, uh, the demand for donations goes up during the summertime because uh, traditionally kids sometimes only get their only meal at school. When there's no school, they look for other means like the food bank. So, And by the way, uh, just a reminder to the viewing audience, I remember, sad but true, remember when we had furlough days as far as school was concerned, and it then became apparent to the general populace, those of us that take breakfast for uh, granted or lunch for granted or dinner for granted, and if we don't take it for granted, it's not like we can't afford it. Like if you decide to skip a meal, it's because you decide to. And that's when we realize that many of these children, as you mentioned, have only one meal per the day, really. That's correct. And uh, I remember last time we talked about, hey, you've never been hungry. You, you get a little rumbling in your tummy. That's just today, not the real type of hungry that uh, these kids and families go through. And of course, with us is your newly appointed president and CEO of the Hawaii Food Bank, uh, Keiki Okaina here on the island of Kauai, Ron Mizutani. Great to see you here. Uh, and and what a, what, a, what a blessing. I mean, you've been in television for many, many decades as a, a young man, and now you're doing something that you really wanted to be here and doing what you're doing. Yeah, after 33 years, Dickie, I, I, you know, my youngest is off to college, so I figured, you know, I always wanted to do some work with nonprofits. I had been at Easter Seals as a board member for eight years, and, and I love the environment, love the people, love the passion, the heart of those who are in nonprofits. And when this opportunity came, uh, I threw my name in the hat and I'm blessed and humbled that uh, they said you're our guy um, and one of the first things I did when I landed was I thought about Kauai and what can we do as a team to give this a more robust and more of a, of, um, a presence on the Garden Island and uh, what Wes and his crew does here for Kauai is truly amazing. And it really came to light and really shine bright uh, during this latest storm. You know, the interesting thing about it is, is that being you had a passion, being that you wanted to help, and you talked about the most recent uh, floods and the storms, and God bless because people came out of the woodwork. But you guys also, in conjunction, had to deal with something that you're still dealing with, and that's something that we cannot comprehend, is the resilience and or there's no end to oh what's happening at the volcano. I mean, our friends over on, at the Food Basket on Hawaii Island, which is our partner on the Big Island, I mean, their, their needs are continuous. Uh, and we don't know when Madame Pele is going to stop. And some, I just the last report, geologists say that this could last years. So it's really changed their lives. Um, and their needs are very great. And their needs are very different from uh, everyday life. I mean, it's not just food and water. They need camping supplies. They need you know toiletries they need uh, children's needs and things that we really take for granted as well so uh yeah we are contributing in a big way and in fact west folks uh, you know noticed the needs were so great they sent a container a matson container of water i mean talk about helping each other i mean and that's just a reflection on on how much Kauai can can help as well even in their time of need uh with the north shore and, and the numbers west were phenomenal when you talk about how many pounds of food went out of this warehouse to the North Shore? You know, and interestingly speaking, as we chat here, you know, some people say we're just, we're islands just separated by water because, you know, every island is going to Kokua, every island. You know, win, lose, or draw, whether you're related to someone or not. But Ron, I had an uh, opportunity to chat with you a little bit later because whenever we think about shipping or air freight, we always think about weight because weight is what is the essential cost as far as moving things around. But you folks have had several partners that actually partnered with you all to help expedite some of the charges that that make it possible. Yeah, um, we have partners at Young Brothers and Matson that help us with shipping across uh, uh, between islands, and they have come in clutch during this uh, uh, recent flood and the volcanic uh, eruption. You know, let me ask the both of you folks, and you know. Um, of course, you live on Oahu. Let's just refer to that as Honolulu. You're here on Kauai. But we tend to see more and more people like, I don't know if they're here on a one-way ticket, but many people, and believe me, I can totally relate, 
live paycheck to paycheck. But there's a lot of hunger out there. Can you can you give us the more fortunate people what the real reality is out there that you see? There, there's on Kauai we serve about thirteen thousand uh, people uh, annually. So that's every month thirteen thousand. Maybe the same people. Uh, sometimes a lot of new ones come in. Um, Forty one hundred is um, kids. Uh, about. Um, 1100 is uh, kupuna having to um, um, provide food on a regular basis for all those people with the additional new ones coming in like you said on a one-way ticket um, is quite challenging so uh, we are asking more and more of, of the community to help us uh, take care of our own you know Wesley and Ron not to be discriminate but what I would like to just say it is proven that so many local people get pride and they're okay. shameful ask or they don't like to say I need help or they rather help people. I mean, it's just by DNA or genetics that locals go and help people before they help themselves. But there comes a point in time that people actually have to realize that help is actually out there and it's identifying those that need the help. So, so get out and, and and be identified and, and no shame at this point in time. Absolutely, and you're right, there is a shame issue and, and that um, it is a so social justice issue that sometimes, uh, sadly, people have to make that choice. I mean, if you think about the numbers, like Wes was talking about, just as Kauai, you know, statewide, 287,000 people are hungry every day. That's one in five of us, you know, look to the food bank to, to, to help serve. And when you think about it, a lot of it kupuna, a lot of it keiki. And, you know, and, and parents who are making, making ends meet, they're not just homeless people. These are families that live paycheck to paycheck. And they have to make those tough choices. Do I pay a medical bill or do I feed my kids? Can you imagine having to make that choice? Do I pay the electric bill or do I feed my children? I mean, that's like tough. So when you think about it that way and, and the needs that are great every single day, not just to mention the crisis and the, and the natural disasters that we have to answer to on a, on a, when they do happen. You know, the needs are great and, and the shame issue is a real thing. It's just breaking that barrier and saying, you know what, there is help out here. Just ask and, and we will respond. And there's a lot of obvious stress involved on that. But when we think about that, you make mention one out of every five, 20 percent of a population based on approximately 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 whatever the state population is, is just extraordinary. You know, when when we watch you and we certainly miss you on the news, but when we watch you on the news, you know, once in a while you might start off with something really cool. Yeah. But at most time it's disaster, downer, bummer, catastrophic. And then the things that should be reported, just get that real nice little smile before you take a commercial break. But I would ma imagine that in your business now, there is got to be a lot of joy and a lot yeah. of pride when you guys are rallying, your board of directors are rallying, or the companies and the people that have that financial means get together and there's a disbursement yeah. and uh, people are happier. Yeah, and, I, and so am I. I mean, my spirit is happier. You can just ask my wife and my family. Uh, after 30 plus years in the news business, it's a grind. You know, the wear and tear, the news fatigue is very real. Um, and what I do every day now, I, I get great joy. I, I, I drive through those gates in our Mapuna Puna warehouse and I feel good. I drive out and I know that we're making a difference in the lives of people who need us greatly and need us very much. So yeah, the joy that I have now, um, not that I didn't enjoy what I did, I did, I enjoyed being uh, a part of that and serving the community in that way uh, on, on news and, and grateful that I had such a long and, and very good career. Uh, but this, this new adventure is very different. And <clears throat> um, you know, when I see and I hear the stories and I see uh, what we do and the, and the smiles on people's faces when they just get a chance to eat I mean, talk about taking stuff for granted. Um, that motivates me. You know, I'm going to be very honest. When my, my mom was a single parent when we were growing up, and, and you know, she worked three jobs. And I, my sister and I ate Vienna sausage out of a can. And it was okay, you know, but uh, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, and, and we made it. And we made it. Uh, but some families don't make it, and they have to make those choices. So that motivates me um, because I came from such a humble background. And you know my roots here are very deep, Dicky. You know that. I mean, I have, <laughs> I have family here, and I would never steer that wrong. I mean, that's where my passion is. How can we make a difference on Kauai in a very, very deep and meaningful way? We're going to invest heavily here. 
We are here to stay, uh, and, and Wes and his crew, we're going to give them every tools they can to make sure that they serve this community and the needs that they have. Yeah, by, by the way, no more shame because we can, uh, brother, pork and beans, hey. canned goods like corn, the aluminum sardine gig, yeah. I mean, Vienna sausage oh, was yeah. the man, you know, back oh, then. Yeah. Still yet. Yeah. Still yet. I mean, if you ask my wife, she asked me what I want for dinner, I tell her what I ate as a keiki. I tell her hot dogs, cream corn, and rice. That's it. I'm good, you know, and, and for some families, that's, that's more than good, you know, and um, I'm just happy to be a part of this and humble to be a part of this. And I love this brother. I'm telling you, he's got a heart of gold. I wish I could have 50 of him and we would, we would turn lives around. We really would, because it all starts with food. I mean, if our kids aren't eating at school, that's affecting their grades. That's affecting how they learn. If our kupuna aren't eating, that's affecting their health. All of these things come into play. And I tell you what, like, like Wes said, if we send food home with the kids on the weekend or in the summer, they're not only sending home food with the kids. Those kids are feeding their families uh, and because of the shame issue, what have you. So that, if you think about it that way, and you, next time you're debating, oh, should I, hey, get on the phone, call Wes, call Michelle Ponoki, and make a difference in this community. Hawaii Food Bank, Kauai Branch is doing wonderful things on the Garden Island. But Wesley Purr is over here, of course, he's the manager here at our food bank here in Pui. Uh, for those that have just joined us, uh, every year we tell people, you know, this is the bare essentials, but what are the most common things that people ask for or the things that's easy to donate? Uh, Non-perishable canned goods like uh, protein, spam, Vienna sausage, pork and beans, uh, canned fruit, canned vegetables, and can I forget the rice? Rice is the most in-demand item. But, but let's try to steer people to the brown rice, the good kind, instead yeah, yeah, yeah. of the <laughs> very sticky white That's rice. What you, you say now, it? but yeah. before, no. But um, we also um, look to get non-food items like uh, diapers, uh, feminine napkins, that kind of stuff. Because folks on food stamps cannot purchase that. So, you know, they use all their uh, food stamps on food, but there's always some gap there. So we look forward to people donating um, toilet paper, um, dish soap, toothpaste, toothbrushes, all that kind of stuff. Okay, now Wesley, give our, uh, educate our viewing audience. What does a dollar do, or what does twenty dollars do, or what does fifty dollars do, or what does a hundred dollars do? In other words, if we magnify the the financial cash side of it, how does that multiply in the world of the food bank? All right, let's see if your math improved from last time. Uh, ten dollars equals twenty-five meals. That's what the food bank can do for the people with ten dollars donated. So twenty-five meals, hundred dollars. Do the math, huh? Yeah, yeah, you do the math. <laughs> do the math. I, can, I can help on that too because, yeah. Dickie, the truth is that we have uh, affiliation with what's called Feeding America. And Feeding America is a network of all the food banks across the country. But to have that affiliation, you have to, I mean, look around. This is like restaurant quality. This warehouse is as clean as it'll come because we get audited. We have to. We're mandated to follow different rules with our refrigerators. I mean, rules that not everybody in, in, in frankly has to follow. Uh, and if you look at Wes's paperwork that he has to file and, and submit, all of that because we need to track every dollar. On top of that, they ex allow us to have relationships with Costco, Safeway, uh, Amazon, and we can stretch our dollar a lot further than, than most people because with that affiliation, we can go to the store or we can purchase items at a much lower cost and make that dollar stretch. So while we do appreciate the canned goods and everything else that come our way in donations during letter carrier time or, or during our food drives, it, money can go a very long way as well. And I'll tell you this, every dollar that comes to the food bank, 95 cents of it goes right back to the community. Only a nickel, and I've seen the paperwork, and I wouldn't look in the camera and say otherwise, only five cents goes to administrative costs. Most nonprofits, all nonprofits, would love to have that kind of uh, numbers on their side. For profits would like to have that kind of numbers on their side. But again, we're very proud of that. And and now that I'm on top of things even more, uh, that is one of my biggest areas that I'm focusing on as well. And if we get overtime, I call Wes. What's going on? 
Uh, but there's always reasons. And of course, with Koei having the North Shore flooding in, there's been great needs for overtime. But we're very conscious of how we spend our money, how we spend your money, uh, because that's our duty. It's our uh, kuleana, and it's also something that's mandated by Feeding America. Well, that's very well said. And I think uh, for those that know you, we can hear the passion because that is a real true passion of love about what you're doing. But on the other side, I can see Auntie Mome Wailani, <laughs> Auntie uh, Keahi, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sister Kehau, they everybody. But they're saying, rules, rules. All of a sudden, <laughs> you got rules. Well, you know the rules. Uh, Wesley Perra, last but not least, uh, you know, the holiday seasons are going to rapidly come up. You know how time goes by really, really quickly. Halloween is kind of fun, but, you know, it's kind of a candy-oriented, kind of a fun kind of a thing. But before you know it, obviously, here comes Thanksgiving, here comes the Christmas holidays, and, and gifts are not the agenda. The food and just living day by day really is what on many people's thoughts. You want to give your uh, aloha to the people quiet to ask them to continue to uh, donate to the food bank and uh, give us uh, your exact location where you're located here on the outskirts of beautiful downtown Puhi. We're located at 4241 Hanahau Place in Apui Industrial just before Mark's Place. Uh, everybody knows Mark's Place on Kauai. Um, we would definitely like to give our aloha to all the folks who have supported us, not just through the holidays, but um, especially rising to the occasion during the, the flood in April. And the months afterwards was just an amazing outpouring of love. Uh, so much uh, donations came in and we just want to assure everyone that uh, donated that all of it goes directly to the flood um, victims out there on the North Shore, East Kauai and in Koloa. You know, and lastly, Wesley, uh, very, very quickly, if you just joined us, we did start off with what's happening, what's the update on the food bank and you did, but please, once again, share the thought about summer and why is summer so important for people to continue to do donate in terms of uh, the keiki. Keiki from low-income families sometimes only experience uh, their nutritious meal of the day while at school. Very, very sad, but it's the reality of things. So um, just prior to summer, we have a food drive campaign, trying to increase our um, warehouse stock so we have more food so that we can give to the kids during the summer because they're at home. Um, you know, they don't get that meal at school and whatever they can get from the food bank, they're going to share with their families. Thank you for a word. And also, I just want to let you know, when we were talking about canned goods, uh, i.e. the famous Spams or the Vienna sausage or the corns or what have you, thank you for also mentioning fruits and vegetables because that's also very, very important and very, very healthy and nutrition. Uh, Ron Mizutani, our president and CEO of our uh, food bank, I want to say congratulations to you. I want to also say thank you for inviting us here to keep people aware and we just really appreciate your heart, soul, your passion, your drive and we want to congratulate you on your new uh, efforts to, you know, not no negative and you did your job to report but now you're doing your job to serve and to, to help and that's going to be a, you're going to be a huge impact for this entire state so we want to congratulate and thank you. Brother, are you crying? I, f I see tears in your eyes. And, you know, Dickie and I are learning, learning, knew each other now over 30 years. And you've seen me sad. You've seen me happy. You've seen, you've experienced family with me. And um, you're going to make me cry now. But um, I, I, you know me. And I'm not, not going to sit here and lie. Um, because this is my home. And my passion for the Kauai people is deep mom and dad from here grandparents from here sisters still here aunties uncles cousins i grew up surfing at kalapaki beach i hitchhiked to the, to the beach every day um you name it Souza's, costas madeiras we all related schumachers so i cannot sit over here and lie i cannot sit over here and bs what i do here is because i believe in this mission i'm humbled to be a part of this legacy and I'm grateful that the leaders of this, the board took a chance on me, a TV guy, and, and said, yeah, we'll give you a shot. And I'm grateful. And I'm grateful for people like Wes and his team, Michelle Panoki and all of them here at uh, our Kauai branch. Without them, a lot of people don't get fed. Our agencies rave about this crew. And I know how many people work in this warehouse. I want it to double it. I want to triple it. 
And I'm working hard on that right now. I'm negotiating a new lease. Hopefully, uh, I have some good news to share very soon because I want to give Wes a bigger home because the needs are so great. It's not because it's too small. As you can see, we're stuffed in here, and, and some, but it comes and goes. I mean, the supply doesn't always last like this. It comes, it goes, it comes and goes, but the needs continue to, to grow. And, and sadly, you know, we want to stamp out hunger. We, we, we are almost there as far as feeding. We can. You ask, we'll be there. But the reality is we need to keep serving. And on Kauai, Oahu, Maui, Big Island, the needs are great. And that's when the food bank is here for you. That's what I wanted to remind you as the president and CEO. Mahalo for Kauai, but you're responsible for everything. And last but not least, the TV guys, not that bad guys. TV guys are good <laughs> brothers and sisters, right, Brother West? That's right. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, we're going to have to take a short break. Well, that uh, includes you too, because you're a TV guy. What was, that's what I was leading up to, bro. That's what I was leading up to. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to take a short, 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 short break. But remember, if we can donate food, if we can donate love, we can donate help. One island, many people, all Kauaians. We're going to have to take a short break. Brother Ron, Brother Wes, we'll be right back. Thank you once again to our Puhi station manager for our Hawaii Food Bank, Kauai chapter, Wesley Pereira, and of course, our very dear friend, the president of the Hawaii Food Bank, Ron Mizutani. Remember, we can help to kokua food. We can help to kokua uh cash anything kokua remember hawaii food bank kauai independent food bank there are hungry people here in our garden island kauai especially when we're approaching the holiday seasons we would have to take a short break but don't go away Valaau. we'll be right back feel the beauty of this sign up down from the beaches to the highest mountain different people living as one in harmony under the sun on the island in the middle of the sea on the Pool Kea island. Golf Course call for your tea times today Hi, I'm Jay Robertson Chairman of the Membership and Public Relations Committee for the Kauai Chamber of Commerce Our committee is responsible for one, services that are provided to the members and encouraging them to continue their membership. Of course, as any chamber grows and gains its membership, it becomes more effective and more influential. Part of the reason you should be a member for the Kauai Chamber is the advocacy that we do on your behalf at the state legislature as well as our county government for action that may impact your business. The other thing is you have a variety of opportunities to network and to socialize with other business members. And we offer some great opportunities to learn. There's some wonderful educating, educating uh, workshops that you can take part in for everything from human resources to legal developments to what may be coming up in the future at, in taxes or human uh, relations issues. So with that, you can learn an awful lot about making your business better. I think one of the primary things you should consider in joining the chamber is that you become a critical part of the fabric of the economy of the island. You actually add something to the whole structure of our economy and you help to make that better. Of course, being a chamber member has a lot of benefits to it and you will certainly find out about those as you join us. We have a variety of committees. We encourage you to be a part of that, but we more importantly really want you to associate with each of the members, build your associations, network, Find out how you can improve your business and be much more successful at what you do. All of that is part of being a member of the Kauai Chamber of Commerce. I'm Jay Robertson, Chairman of the Membership and Public Relations Committee for your Kauai Chamber of Commerce. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Valao. We'd like to sincerely thank each and every one of you for watching Valao. Don't forget now, Valao, Spectrum Cable, Channel 128. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, 7 a.m., 12 noon, 4 p.m., 7 p.m., and 12 midnight. Also, I'll let you folks know via social media when we have it posted on YouTube. YouTube, of course, will be Valaau Kauai, W-A-L-A-A-U Kauai, K-A-U-A-I. It is time for us to hail on. As always, let's all continue to take care of our families, our friends, the neighbors of Malahini and Diana, and we'll check you out next week. I'm Lee. Stay safe, Kauai. On Valaau. Fala out, fala out, fala out.